Good morning, church. Great to be here at Southland this morning. Well, the time is here. The word bittersweet has been on my mind a lot all week long. Thinking about today, thinking about the last service. Uh, my beautiful wife, April, and I, as we head over en route to the Middle East to spread the good news. But truly, this is an amazing church. And uh, we owe so much to this church. You have been our spiritual family, our home. Uh, literally the entire time, year and a half, we've been married. We've been right here in Southland. And uh, wow, you know, graduations, baptisms, Woo! weddings. We got married in this church. And uh, that's what families are all about. Certainly not the church I grew up in, but I'm glad to be part of this amazing church in so many ways. You've given us the love and the support that we've needed to grow, to mature, and really prepare for a very difficult mission field. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for my wife that she married me, that she got a passport with a lot of squiggly lines in it. Uh, but as I was looking around the room this morning, I was there's so many that mean so much to me and us. And thank you for being my brother, my sister, my moms, my my spiritual kids. And uh, it means the world to me. It means the world to April as well. So we love you. It's great to have the Kernans here. Uh, great to have the Kirshners. We had a great dinner with them last night. So grateful for the Hardings. Uh, wow, Ron, I, I, you came at just the right time. And uh, Ron and I have a lot of the same battle scars, and uh, we just keep pushing on. So many of you mean so much to me, and I, I pray that uh, before we get on the plane, that we get a chance to share with almost every one of you um, how much you mean to us, because uh, you really do. I've been fighting back tears all day. Let's turn to Second Peter chapter 1. It is amazing to see all the visitors and our friends here today. Because you've not just stepped into some normal church. You've stepped into the house of God. And wow, it is amazing to see. I'm so encouraged by the future of Southland, the changes we've made, and some of the things that are going to be happening. And it's just looking around. It's like, wow, i got a lot of people i got to meet. You're like, who is this guy up there? I don't know. Second Peter chapter 1. All right, come on, bro. You know, I was driving over this morning with Jamal, and we had a great prayer on the way over. And I was thinking how exciting of a life this is. How excited it is to be in Southland. How exciting it is to be with other Christians and disciples. How exciting it is to be alive. How exciting it is to be living in the good old USA. How exciting it is to literally be alive, to have a great church, to have a great family that I'm a part of, that changes everything. I'm excited about being saved. Yes. I'm excited about the incredible God that we serve yes. and his incredible son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A lot of people will ask me, they say, R.D., what's your favorite scripture? Because that's my name, R.D. And well, here's one of them that I want to share with you this morning. It's in 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll start in verse 5. Peter, kind of at the end of his life, he's no longer bumbling and stumbling around like he was in the beginning, but he says... For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my dear brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that an awesome passage? Yes. Just highlight that thing in your Bibles. I think uh, the one fact that I've discovered in my life as I just turned 50 this past year, amen, 50-year-olds, 
Or if you join up, you're 50 if you add them together. Is I'm guided by a certain sense of inspiration. It's the fact that I do the things I like to do. And I don't do the things I don't like to do. Isn't that amazing? It's like my dad says, it's like rocket surgery. I just do the things I like to do. And the things I don't like to do, I don't do them. And the thing I think about is if we're going to remain Christians the rest of our lives. Some of you, I look at some of you guys like Gary. It's like 40, 50 more years. Amen, Gary, you just got baptized. But I think about that and I think we're going to have to figure out how to like it. And I think that's where a lot of us fail. For some, being a Christian is, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be cursed by God. I don't want to get in trouble for all the things I've done. But rarely is, I chose to be a Christian because it's the most exciting life that there is. People say to me, as well, RD, you always seem so excited. I'm going to share why I'm so excited. You know, what makes the Christian life exciting? I think Peter right here gives us an amazing clue. He says, if you do these things in increasing measure, you're going to have an effective and productive life. Isn't that incredible? That, that means things are going to be happening in your life. You're going to be growing. You're going to be expanding. Your horizons are going to go. Yeah, you're going to hit obstacles, but you're going to turn those into opportunities. And when you're growing as a Christian, that leads to an exciting life. When you look back and say, wow. And Peter's saying, if you do these things, you will never fall. You won't fall into immorality. You won't fall into impurity. You won't fall into the sins that you struggle with before you came into the kingdom. You will never fall. I love that. Some people, they think by becoming a Christian, they think, oh, I can never live by the Bible. And that's literally because you haven't figured out how to make it exciting for you. That was me. You know that Mary Poppins. I know a lot of you are big Mary Poppins fans. Remember that song, Spoonful of Sugar? I never knew what that song meant. It actually means that if you want to take medicine, you have a spoonful of sugar and it helps the medicine go down. I thought, wow, that's interesting. Literally, that it's all about figuring out how to make things fun. And I think sometimes that's where we can fail. Amen? Amen. You know, I think there's too many bitter and sour people on our, our planet today. Yeah. Too many sour, eating lemon type of people. I guarantee we have enough already. Yeah. I think about there's never been a call for, hey, let's get more depressed, discouraged, sour, and bitter people in the world. Yeah. I think down there, when is the last time you've heard, hey, here's a 24-hour uh, sermon and sermonette on frustration? Or down at the college campus, how to get bitter without a college degree. Why not? How about a class entitled, how to get frustrated with your family? How to get frustrated with your job? How to get frustrated when there's really no reason to get frustrated at all? That's not out there. Why? Because nobody wants to be discouraged and depressed, frowning all the time with a frown on their face. Who's this sermon for this morning? Today, I, I'm going to speak to those who are feeling weak in their faith. Many of us think, uh, well, I'm strong in the Lord because I go to church. That's like saying you love your job because you go to work. What? What? <laughs> it just don't work. Today, I want to speak to those who are thinking about becoming Christians. Thinking about becoming disciples. I'm doing this lesson for you today. But today also, I'm doing this lesson for those of you who feel like you're strong in the Lord. You know, you feel like you're strong in the Lord. I'm just fired up for Jesus. Well, today, you need to take it higher because you've been strong in the same place for way too long. So, what is exciting? Well, for me, it's sports. I, I love sports. I thought, you know, baseball, basketball, and football, you know, the big three. But I got to be honest, I mean, watching guys kick a soccer ball around, that gets exciting. Uh, I get excited when guys punch each other in the face until one falls down. I don't even know. It's fun. You know, I, I don't know if that's a sin I got to repent of, but that's exciting. 
<laughs> but I get so into it. I can literally participate with the athlete. They fall down, I fall down. They get up, I get up. There's a big play and I start sweating. I start thinking, oh my gosh. And I start feeling the pressure. I'm getting excited as if I'm in the arena with them. I get excited. I, you paint my face. Put on a barrel, go to the games, yell and scream. Hey, we know how to get excited, don't we? We know how to get fired up. But here's the thing. It's amazing to me how many Christians don't get excited by living the Christian life. I get as excited as we do about other people living their life. Like, oh, I wish I was LeBron James. I wish I was Russell Westbrook. I wish I was Chris Anderson. I wish I was, I wish I was Kenneth Woods. Or, or maybe Denzel. Or, or Kenrick. <laughs> That's a handsome guy right there. But we don't want to be ourselves. Maybe a woman, you're like, I want to be Serena Williams. I want to be that Beyonce. I want to be some great actress. You know, you think about, well, the reason is we don't want to be Christians. Because we haven't figured out how to make Christianity exciting. Now we will point our fingers at why we're not excited. Sometimes, especially with me, I can point my fingers at somebody who's stopping me from being excited. That brother's keeping me from being excited to be in Jesus Christ. But you know what I've discovered? The only person that's been with me consistently throughout my entire life is me. I've been there every step of the way and I haven't figured out how to make Christianity exciting when I'm walking around with a dull, sour look on my face. Our ability to get down and discouraged and depressed is something we've developed all on our own through years of practice. Here's a point I want to make. Really lean in on this one. If the Christian life is lived according to the Bible, it will be full of it will be joyful. It will be exciting. It will be inspiring. So if your life is not these things, I think you've got to take a good, long, closer look at the Bible. Because my Bible says Jesus promises that Christianity will be life to the full. That's what my book says. See, I believe a lot of us, we just kind of forgot how to get excited. We get excited at events. Yesterday was a great, great event. Chris and Vanessa got engaged. Amazing. Watching Chris Bryant get down on his knee and, and propose, that was an exciting event. We get excited about engagements. We get excited about a lot of great events, but the thing is, the real question is not, are they excited when they got engaged? Hey, everybody who gets engaged is excited when they get engaged. That's a no-brainer. The question is, are they excited when they've been married for three years? Yeah. Or, or 17 months? Yeah. See, when you haven't figured out the Christian life, when somebody that's not excited marries somebody else that not ex that's not excited, guess what? Then you have double time boredom, double time discouragement, and the reason is neither have figured out how to be happy. So just getting married is not going to solve it for you. You know what I got excited about when I was a Christian, before I became a Christian? Sinning. Think about it. You know, some of us, we, the only way we knew how to get excited was commit sins. Yeah. You know, I've been in many a locker room. Wow. And boy, we like to share about all the sins we committed. Man, let's, guess what I did last night? Did this, did that, did yeah. Did. See, for some of us, excitement is literally going out, getting drunk, smoking weed, taking drugs, and sleeping with somebody. Yeah. And we got fired up about that. Some of us, it's going out doing something foolish and surviving with your life. Where I'm from in Atlanta, we used to have this saying, one of the most off-said things before someone died was, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> Where's Matt? Where's my, I got some Georgians here. We get excited because we, we did something foolish and sinful and we got away with it. 
You know, sometimes it's just pulling off a lie and getting away with it. Did something deceitful. See, we've figured out how to get excited about doing what is wrong, but have we figured out about getting excited about doing what is right? Because if you haven't, that would not be the Bible's fault. That would be our fault. It's our fault that we don't look at righteousness as exciting. You know, and think about that, that we don't get thrilled when we were tempted to look at pornography and we walked away from it. How many times have you high-fived each other for that? Or when your boss, something's happening, it's a lot of pressure, you're tempted to lie, and you choose not to lie, regardless of the consequences, but you just did what was right? Do you get excited and thrilled about that? Why do we get excited about sin in the past and don't get as excited about just being righteous? Wouldn't that be great? In the fellowship, just high-five each other. I was tempted to sin, but didn't high five, brother. You know, I look at Jesus Christ and his life, and you know, he seemed to be having a pretty good time. I look at his life. If you read the Bible, Jesus was feeling pretty good about himself. I look at this, you know, he went to a wedding, made some wine. The Bible said it was the best tasting wine there ever was. He was known as eating and drinking and hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. That was his reputation. Yeah. I look at his life. He was always outside in nature. Always with people. Yeah. He was having fish fries. He was camping. Yeah. He was eating. Man, that guy was enjoying his life. Yeah. There was a lot of food described around Jesus' ministry. Yeah. And as a foodie, yeah. as somebody who likes food, Jesus was loving, loving his life. Yeah. Right? So if you're not enjoying your life, you're not living like Jesus. Don't blame Jesus if you found a way to make Christianity boring, dull, lifeless, and unexciting. Don't blame Jesus when you found to make Christianity a burden. Because you know what my Bible says? Obeying God's commands is not a burden. It literally says that, 1 John 5, verse 3. Or his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I like that, Matthew 11, verse 30. So don't blame Jesus, blame yourself. Then you can repent and have an exciting Christian life. Amen. Let's go over to uh, Luke chapter 5. You know, I know a lot in my life, I have wanted people to feel like I gave them something Amen. and helped them. That's how I wanted to leave my life. Giving people something that didn't hurt them. And what a better man to imitate than Jesus Christ. The only place I find, time after time after time, where you can make your life one that helps people is when you're living according to God's word. When you're striving to be like Jesus, He's the only man I've ever read about in history, and I've read a lot of history, who succeeded in making his life a help to so many people, even after his death. Wow. Jesus is still helping people. He made his very, his very life special by having a nothing is impossible attitude. Yeah. You know, I think about the things that rob my own faith, and my own zeal, and my own excitement. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. I think fear is one of those things. I think... We probably don't address it as much in our, in our hearts. A fear of maybe looking bad. Yeah. You know, sadly, many do not become Christians simply because of what other people might think. Yeah. That prevented me from really seeking God for 26 years. What's people going to think? What's my mom going to say? What's my friends going to say? How about the fear of failure that controls so many people? You know, the things that we've never tried that we maybe should have tried because we're so afraid to try because we fear failure. In many ways, you know, I think people grow old not because of the physical aging of their bodies. I think they grow old because they don't do the things that they dreamed about, the things they never tried and the bitterness that comes with that emptiness. I never tried it. Do you realize how many doors are closed to you when you fear failure, when really life is simply just about making the effort. Yeah. Yeah. Trying, maybe failing, but you tried and you made the effort. Yeah. And God gives us that ability. How about worry? 
I think many of us are overcome by just simply worrying. Wow, we worry about so much. We spend so much of our days worrying, and it's such a destructive thing. Yeah. But the challenge is, you put worry and fear together, your, your funeral is just years away. <laughs> Many of us don't realize we struggle in life because we're so consumed by worry and fear. Yeah. We worry about everything. What people think of us. Will my spouse stay with me? Will my kids turn out to be okay? We worry about what the future holds instead of who holds the future. We worry about so much in our lives that we have a terrible life. And the result is our lives are not exciting and they're not fun. Do you know when you worry? Can you feel it when you're worried? When you feel that pressure and you fear? So what happens? Well, then we just start not feeling well, so we get faked out. We said, well, let's just go. Let me go back into the world. Surely that has the things I want to pursue, and that'll bring me all the joy and happiness. But then you pursue it, and you find out the world didn't have what I needed. The world didn't offer that. Short-term pleasure, but there's no long-term anything. You know, I've, I've figured these things out in my 24 years as a disciple. So much of your faith is where you put your faith. If you want your faith to last, you better be careful about where you put your faith. I think, I, I, for me, I put my faith in myself. And if I do that, when I fail, I've now lost my faith. Or when I put my faith in other people. It can be a spouse, it can be a leader, whatever. As soon as that other person lets me down and fails me, I have now lost my faith. Well, what about my accomplishments? Surely if I just put my faith in what I can accomplish, what I can do, what I can produce, the minute I stop producing and accomplishing, I've now lost my faith. But if I can put my faith in God and His incredible Son, Jesus Christ, who will never let me down, His promises are always true, my faith will literally last to the finish line. What makes the Christian life exciting? And why did I turn you to, to Luke chapter 5? Well, it's a good question. You know, if you're a Christian, it's sometimes doing what's never been done before. Doing what's never been done before. You know, if you're a Christian and you're not doing things in your life that have never been done before, I think eventually you'll leave the Lord and die spiritually. Because you just can't stay in the same place 30, 40, 50 years of your life and expect to be excited about life. There's no way that you can stay committed to God and remain in the same place all the time. When you go after a dream, or when you go after a vision or something that God has put on your heart, just pursuing it builds your faith. I, I don't think I grew up wanting to be in the Middle East. I couldn't even find that on a map. They say, well, we want you to go to the Middle East. I thought, where's that, Baltimore? Like, just how middle are we talking? Why do I need a passport to go east? <laughs> Arabic? What? But when you start pursuing your dreams and you start seeing God opening a door here or opening a door there, you see, start seeing a team come together. You see walls getting knocked down. You go to a place that you can't even pronounce. And, and alphabets that are so squiggly, you can't figure out what they're saying. <laughs> and then your faith in God, just, it just grows because you realize I'm not alone. Yeah. God's with me and God's yeah, making yeah, these things right. happen. <laughs> Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There's no sadder thing than when a Christian feels alone. When a disciple of Jesus Christ feels alone. And I think most people suffer in this world because they feel all alone. When you feel all alone, you start thinking, I've got to get this job. I've got to make this happen. I've got to create this opportunity. I've got to make these connections. But the faithful Christian just simply says, God's with me. And if I pursue him, he opens the doors. God changes hearts. God changes minds. God has been studying the book of Daniel. God even opens the heart of non-believers. 
and has them favorably disposed to you. Ain't that amazing? And when you see God working in your life, it fires you up. It gets you excited. You see God opening doors. It helps, it helps your faith to grow. And that is exciting. So is your life exciting? Sometimes we don't realize that we're dumpy and we're bored because we're doing nothing. We sit on the couch and we eat potato chips and dip, complaining about all the other people that are out there doing life and doing their thing. That is not a life. That is a walking death. And it's funny because when I realized I was in that place, I was in Minnesota of all places, hiding in my cave, far from God, I realized, wait, I'm not doing anything. There was no reason to live. You can't go to the gym enough. You can't eat enough chicken wings. You can't root enough for the Denver Broncos. It just doesn't work. It's empty. It's a chasing after the wind. Again, if that's you, repent and challenge yourself to live a life that God calls us to live. Here's a few questions for you. What could you do in your life today that would challenge your faith? That would inspire your faith. That would help your faith to grow. What could you do to fulfill a lifelong dream of yours? And how could those things lead to people being saved? Here's something else I picked up along the way. If you've got a dream or something you want to do or accomplish or pursue that does not lead to people being saved, it is not of God. God ain't no part of that. But that's the way some of us dream. We think something will, that will, God will give to us. We think literally something will get us where we want to go. Us and we, me and my, not to something that can lead to people being saved. Right. You know, if you're visiting and you're wondering, well, what's so important about being saved? Why else would you do something? Think about that. For money? You know, let's make money. Is that the goal? Just make some money. But what if you don't succeed in making money? What if that fails? Well, your life is over. Because your whole pursuit was making money. Go check out the suicide demographics. It's very rarely poor people who kill themselves. But if your pursuit of life is to saving people, for Jesus Christ, to making true disciples, and, and building God's family, it doesn't matter what you fail at in life. You baptize people, you have treasures in heaven, and you have succeeded. Yeah. Amen? I think for me, sometimes we can get so enamored with the image and what's on the outside of the cup that we forget what really matters. I know I've fallen into this trap many times that it's not important what's really happening. It's just how it looks on the outside. Our name, our image looks good. I don't think that's a life worth living either. No. I've tried to live that life. No. Things can be going so horrible on the inside. But what's really going on outside? That's all about image. I'm good. Everything's good. Uh. Fired up for Jesus. <laughs> and your life is just a total wreck. Yeah. I don't think... It's a great life when you're constantly having to put on a show. So that everyone thinks you're having a really great life. Do you know what I think having a great life is all about? A great life is actually having a great life. Again, it's, it's not rocket science. Your dreams, your visions, do they lead to people being saved? Helping others attain salvation where eternal life is the most satisfying thing you can do. And we get to Luke chapter 5, verse 1. All right. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. That was my introduction. Oh. I've got 15 points today that spell serendipity. <laughs> verse 1. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. With the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. 
When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we've not caught a thing. But, since you say so, <laughs> I'll let down the nets. Doing what's never been done before. Have you done something that's never been done before? Here, Peter, a fisherman, is going to take advice about fishing from a carpenter. Just because Jesus said so. Ain't that cool? To go back and fish again in the same spot where he had tried so many times before and failed. Have you ever had to go back to the same spot and try to do something where you've gone and failed so many times? Yeah. Try doing it with the Lord this time. Because when you do something that's never been done before, especially when you've tried so many times your own way to do it, that builds your faith. And when your faith is built, you start feeling good about yourself, you start smiling, and you have the exciting Christian life. Have you done something that's never been done before? For some of you, it's being baptized. Yeah, I've never been baptized. What does that mean? Well, go check it out. I'll ask you, is my life everything it could be? Ask yourself that question. Do something that's never been done before. Let's keep reading. Come on, bro. Come on. My third point is be astonished. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he literally fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That's, that's broken right there. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. How do you know when you've done something that's never been done before? When you sit back and you're completely astonished. Yeah. When you realize there's no way I could have done that on my own. That had to be God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amen. God. And who gets the glory? God, God gets the glory. Yeah. I love that. When after you've completed it, you're astonished. You sit back and say, I never could have done that without God's help. Yeah. That's how your faith is built. So the question is, when is the last time you've been astonished by something you did through God? I challenge you to go do it. Maybe you're thinking, I'm getting worn out being a Christian. It's because you're not doing anything new. Peter talked about a faith that's been proved genuine by the testing of your faith. Look through your life. Look through your diary, your daytime. Is anything you're doing in your day-to-day -day walk with God building your faith because if you know the outcome of what you're doing it's not faith we know what faith is your faith has got to be growing and then you get excited you know I think we have an inherent need as Christians to grow to take a leap of faith take risks keep our faith growing doing something that's never been done before being astonished for some the problem is we've set we're so set in our ways we're so set in our routine that signing up for a mission field would be unfathomable. Yeah. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm, I'm going to recruit every single person here to go to the Middle East with me. <laughs> I'm going to sign up table right over here. And we're finished? <laughs> but what are you doing to inspire your faith? I think about myself, for me, to go into a restaurant and order a different meal off the menu is a tremendous victory. That's, 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 that's. I go to certain restaurants, they don't even ask me my order no more. Here's your, here's your food, sir. What are you doing that's, that's new and exciting that God can work in your life? Let's finish in Luke 5. Asking for the impossible. Asking for the impossible. If you do not pray, you cannot have an exciting Christian life. Yeah. I'll just say that now. Yeah. I love my wife's prayer life. 
She's always challenging me to pray. Honey, we need to pray. On the way, you need to pray before your sermon. And pray again. I love April's prayer life. I love praying with some of you guys. Exciting is when you see miracles. I don't believe God's out of the miracle business. You know, I look at it like Johnny and Janae Stallworth over here, and I look what God has done in their life. Miracle. Miracle. Well, your church don't believe in miracles. Oh, yes, I do. And yes, we do. Tracy Harding married Ron Harding. Leanne married Tim. And April Diaz married R.D. Baker. I believe in miracles. Throw that in there. God is not out of the miracle business. Are you asking for the impossible? Have you ever prayed for God to do something and happen in your life that you thought was impossible? Verse 12. While Jesus is, was in one of the towns, a man came along and was covered with leprosy. Let me tell you, lepers had no social life. No. They would have bells tied around them. I mean, if you've ever seen lepers, it, it's hideous. I've been down to southern India. It is hideous. And let me tell you, this guy, the Bible says, was covered with it. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, can you make me clean? In other words, can you do the impossible? They couldn't cure leprosy back then. There wasn't a Rite Aid down the street or something like that. He literally was asking the Lord to do something that was impossible. An impossible prayer. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. He said, look, I need some help. I need help over here. I know you can do it. But will you do it? What a great passage. I mean, the question isn't, can God help you? The question is, are you willing to ask for it? What? Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him. Why did the leprosy leave him? Well, because he went to some doctors? No, the doctors didn't cure him. Was it some newfangled thing they had that some pharmaceutical company know? No. Jesus said, I know it's impossible. And I am willing. And it says immediately he was cured from leprosy. How many of us, honestly, when we pray, we believe that God is willing? That we believe that God is on our side. That he wants you to have the things that you want. That he wants your life to be good. I know when I was in my darkest time of my life, where I had left God, I was bitter, I was angry at God. I never stopped believing in God. I didn't start thinking, you know, like, was there a God? I wanted you. No, I knew there was a God. I was just angry at God. Because things didn't turn out the way I had planned. I had it all planned out. Everything was going to be great. Going right to heaven. And God said, no, no, no. Because we got to get something, because there's still one thing you lack. Yeah. And that's going to keep you out of heaven. What is the one thing you lack? And, and I look at this and, and I, I started believing that God was no longer pulling from me. What a horrible place to be in. I could not read Jeremiah 29 11. Oh, really, God, you got my back? You're there for me? What a horrible spot to be in when you start thinking God is not going to take care of you. It's like uh, Acts chapter 12. I love that little passage in the Bible where where these guys are praying. Peter's been imprisoned. Uh, James has just been killed. Or was it no, Andrew. Andrew had just been killed. Anyway, they're praying for Peter to be released from prison. And there's that funny scene that unfolds. They're in there praying, God, please release Peter from prison. Peter starts banging on the door. And, and the little servant girl's over there, Rhoda, she's, you know, Peter's here. Shh, you're interrupting our prayer meeting. What are you praying for? We're praying for Peter to be released. He's at the door. We don't actually believe what we're praying. How many times do we not believe what we actually pray for? That's a tough spot to be in. Or if you're like me, you believe, amen. God's promises are awesome and they're true for everybody else but me. God's plans, he's going to perform miracles for everybody but me. 
What a tough spot to be in. You're like that guy in Mark 9. You know, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. <laughs> Do you have faith and doubt mixing in the same brain? We come to God not with an are you willing, I know you can attitude. We come to God with a, I have to talk to you now. I'm so sorry, God. I'm hearing in prayer. Things are a mess. Life is awful. I've got to put in some time with you so that you won't curse me. I often wonder how God feels about my coming to him every morning in prayer. Does God get fired up when I come to him in prayer? Oh, Lord, it's me again. Oh, where do I begin? I've got so many problems. It's awful. This cross is so rugged. It's this calluses and it's awful. And we just lay out God all our problems. Does God, does God get excited about that? I believe a lot of us, if we had a great prayer life, we would smile more. We would laugh more. People say, you're always smiling, you're always laughing. Because I love God. I think we'd be more joyful if we had a better prayer life. When is the last time you've asked God for something impossible and got it? Because you can't keep it off your face if that's true. A frowning, sad, dull, lifeless, boring person has not received something they never expected. Jesus healed this guy because he got up in his face. And the same will be said for you. Verse 17. The bottom line is an unexciting prayer life leads to an unexciting Christian life. Final point. One day, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralytic on a mat, some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, all right, friend, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that great? The friend's faith and, and blowing their friend down there and taking all this stuff. Your sins were forgiven. Jesus was impressed. Jesus said, your sins wiped out. He was blown away. These friends believed in Jesus so much that they were determined to find a way to get to him. Does that describe us? What is the lesson? Nothing's going to happen for you. You're going to have to make it happen. Too many times we sit around waiting for someone else to come and motivate you to be close to God. It's not the way it works. I love that passage, uh, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. Looking for hearts who are fully committed to him, right? Yeah. No. You know what it says? It says searching to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Yeah. I'm weak. Well, is your heart fully committed to God? God's looking to strengthen us. Yeah. And I think that's the lesson here. Waiting for someone to pull us aside and say, you don't look happy. What's wrong? Can I get you some tea? Can I give you a shoulder rub? It's time to take charge of your life, no matter where you're at, and seek the life that truly is life. The Christian life is the most exciting life you can have. I think I've tried different sources. This is the most exciting life you can have. Is April and I, and Anna, and Deo, and Jamal, the Twassons, this mission team. <laughs> As we go to the Middle East, it's not because I've got some crazy death wish or, you know, that I had some dream as a kid to go be a missionary to the Middle East, RD of Arabia, you know. It's not, I want my life to matter. I want my life to make a difference. In 1995, when Corey Blackwell called me and said, would you come help me build South Central? I came. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Why would I not fit into South Central? I'm white. My three <laughs> girls are white. Blue eyed, blonde hair. Sure. <laughs> Why not? Sure. 
couple years later, he called me on Thanksgiving and said, I'm so thankful for you. By the way, would you go east? Well, I want you to go to the Middle East and plant churches. Why not? I can't pronounce that country. I can't even spell it. Let's go plant a church there for Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's some death wish? No! Uh, I wanted God to use my life. I wanted God to say, look, yeah, I can use you. And who wouldn't fit in when you look like me in the Middle East? My girls, my three daughters went from being the only white kids in their school at Leapwood Elementary in Carson to being the only Americans in their school somewhere in the Middle East on an island. Wow. No problem. The calls come again 18 years later. After five years in the Middle East and, and many more years putting my heart in that place, the time has come for my wife and I to go over and do it again. And the only response I can have, why not? The Christian life is the most exciting life that can be lived on planet Earth. And on top of that, we get eternity in heaven to boot. Is it challenging? You betcha. But it's worth it. Get excited about being saved. Get excited about this amazing fellowship in this church that God is building right here before our eyes. Get excited about being right with God and get excited about living like Jesus Christ. I love you. We love you. Amen.